What's up everyone? 5280 Reefer here. Back at you again with another episode. In today's episode, I have my little co-host joining me, my son of Eddie's. <laughs> he wanted to join me for this video. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, buddy. So, in today's video, I kind of wanted to talk about the unending battles of reef keeping. And what I mean by this is just the issues that we run into, the things that we have to go through just to keep these reef tanks alive and to keep them to the standards that we personally think are best for our tanks, whether that be chemically, visually, uh, so on and so forth. So let's start at the beginning. Let's say you're setting up a brand new reef tank. Well, you're super excited, you figure out what tank you want to get, you start figuring out what equipment you want to run, you piece it all together and you set it on up. You set it up, you put your rocks in, you put your sand in, or you don't, depending if you have sand or bare bottom, whatever you choose, and you start the cycle. And I'm not going to go into the detail of starting with cycled rock or like reef rock or anything like that. I'm just, no matter what, you're going to be going through battles one way or another. New tank, you get it cycling, boom, you finish cycling. You're like, all right, now you get super excited about the fish that you're going to put into your aquarium. So you decide what fish to get, you go with those. And then for some reason, you get the fish and your fish dies. Now you're trying to figure out, figure out what's going on. Why did that fish die? What happened? So you go into a slew of testing. You test your ammonia, you test your salinity, so on, so forth. And that's just the beginning of the battle. So that's battle one. And then after that battle is done, you move on to algae growth. If you pop on your lights and you have a bunch of excess nutrients in your tank, well, now all of a sudden you're fueling all this algae growth all over your rock. And it's super disheartening because you see all this algae growth. You're like, it's disgusting. It's ugly. So once the algae pops up, you know, a bad mistake that we make is by trying to remedy the situation very quickly and not helping the situation out and letting it play through and figuring out the root cause of the issue. A lot of people will tend to see that, hey, I have high nitrates, high phosphates. Well, they stop feeding their fish. They throw in a bunch of GFO or some lanthanum or anything like that to drop those nutrients down. And then they strip all the nutrients and slowly the algae starts going away, but then they start seeing some film on their sand bed come in. And then they see it turn slimy, and then they get dinoflagellates. And then that's a whole battle that you don't even want to get into. And we have to tell ourselves to slow down. So once we use things like GFO, lanthanum, you know, anything like that, that's supposed to help us no pox, uh, that's supposed to help us with combating nutrients when our tanks are so young, we end up stripping the water. And once you strip the water, you start noticing, hey, the algae issue is going away, but now all of a sudden you've got a slime forming on your sand bed. And you're like, Ah, what is this crap? And then you look, and most commonly, it'll be cyanobacteria. Well, you're like, well, cyano's supposed to be red. Why is this slime brown? And then you figure out you actually have dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates are a little devil that are very hard to deal with, and, and honestly, uh, they'll always be in your tank. But that's a whole different story. So you got that figured out, too. So then you're like, all right, now I can start adding some coral to my tank. You're at about the six month mark of a tank. And you start adding some tester corals. And hey, the tester coral is starting to do great. You got it and it's growing, it's encrusting, it's coloring up. 
So you start getting some more coral and then some more coral. And by the eight, nine month, month mark, your tank has been filled with a decent amount of coral. And then all of a sudden you start getting die off on those corals. And you're trying to figure out what's going on. Your testing's been good. Your salinity is right. Your calcium, magnesium, your alkalinity, everything is good. What's going on? Well, you end up getting an ICP and your ICP ends up showing you that you have some heavy metals in your tank. Then you have this whole battle of figuring out where that heavy metal is coming from, how it's getting into your tank and how you can fix it. You got past that problem. So now your tank looks good. You're getting close to the one year mark and you're beside yourself. It's like a breath of fresh air. You're like, hey, my tank is stabilizing. My tank is looking good. I'm not having any issues. And then you start seeing some bite marks on your corals. And you're like, oh, well, what's going on? Why is my coral looking so crappy? And you look at it closer and you see that there's bite marks and there's eggs at the bottom or you see that there is some uh, aptasia growing right under the coral, stinging it. And then you look more and you see more and more aptasia. And keep in mind that any of these things can happen at any time. It's not like all these things happen at a certain time period. They can happen whenever. Uh, for my tank, I started noticing the Aptasia about the one and a half year mark, maybe one year and three months, something like that. That's when I started noticing the Aptasia in my tank. So you try to figure out what to do with that. So now you're fighting that battle. And let's say you get that battle under control. And you're getting closer to the one and a half, two year mark. So your tank is a lot more stable now. You know, your bacterial colonies are a lot more mature. Your corals are a whole lot bigger. Um, the corals that have made it are thriving and just doing what they're doing. You know, they're just growing and they're happy as can be. And you kind of become complacent with where you're at. You're like, hey, this is wonderful. You know, if I could just keep this going and I don't want to add more, I don't want to do nothing. I just want, I want to keep this going. Then around the two year mark, you start hitting the point where your corals start growing into each other. You could hit this mark a lot earlier, but usually around the two year mark, your corals start growing into each other. So now you have to worry about coral warfare. So that's a whole new battle you have to deal with. I mean, that's a fun battle. In the beginning, you know, you're like, hey, I get to frag all this coral. Uh, I can sell them or I can trade them or I can trade them in at my LFS, you know, so I can get some dry goods for the aquarium. So it's not costing me to run this aquarium. So it's, it's kind of a fun battle there, but it does get annoying and it starts getting to the point where there's so much to do and so much to cut and you gotta remember anytime you cut a coral it, if you have a bunch of colonies in your tank and you have to start fragging a bunch so they're not fighting each other well if you take 10 frags off of one coral it's gonna reduce the consumption that coral has you know yeah those frags are gonna still stay in your tank but it's still going to lower the, the consumption of your alkalinity because no matter what, you hurt the coral, right? So it's got to heal over those, those spots and, and get back to the peak of growth that it was at. So let's say you got that covered too. Well, next thing, depending on the choices of fish you had, you know, you can run into a thing where, hey, you want to get this new fish, like me, in, for instance. I wanted to get that copper, uh, copper band butterfly. 
uh, to help with the Aptasia issue. Well, my other fish that have been in this tank for such a long time prevented that. The fish in my tank are what prevented me from being able to get that copper band. So now I have to wait for that stripey that's really tiny in hopes that it actually makes it in my tank. So that can be a battle in itself. You know, if you made the choice of getting tangs, um, especially the zebra somas, they're aggressive. They're very aggressive. And anything that has the same body shape as them, they will go after it because they think it's another tang. They don't know any better. And um, it can be a mission trying to get them to comply with what you want in your tank, but a lot of the times it's it's not possible to actually get it done. You know, it's like no matter what you try, they're just going to end up killing that fish. Next up, you know, even at two years, once those corals start getting bigger, once your fish start getting bigger, you need to feed the fish a little more. You know, those fish are growing. It's We got to think about the fish as we do our children. You know, when they when our children are growing, we don't feed them a whole lot when they're little, but as they grow, you have to feed them more and more to keep up with the metabolism of the child, their caloric intake. So same thing goes for fish. You know, if we were feeding this these fish one cube of mysis a day at the beginning, let's say a year ago, and we're still only feeding them one cube a day, well, that's not really going to be enough, you know, those, those fish are going to start getting skinny, they're going to start, you know, having issues, getting sickly, getting ick all the time, and, and it's just not a very good recipe for success. So as the coral grow, we want to increase the amount of food we feed them incrementally. I'm not saying you have to go from one cube to ten or anything like that, but you want to at least increase it like a cube and a half you know watch the fish see if the fish is getting thin if, if you can because a fish is supposed to have like a shape to it you know what i mean and if it's just a, a flat piece it's not very happy it's starving you know so based off of that if you start feeding your tank more well they're going to be pooping more right and if they're pooping more that means your nutrients are going to go up so that can cause a spike in your nutrients which is going to make you get another algae issue so we have to always take into consideration everything that's happening in our tanks that it's growing and at the same time you can also be like hey yeah the fish are growing they're eating more, they're pooping more, but my corals are growing more too, and they're taking up more nutrients as well. So yeah, it could balance out naturally, but it's highly unlikely that it would that you would hit that perfect balance of feeding your fish just enough to where your coral are taking up all of the nutrients and you're not having any issues, you don't have any excess in your water. And we don't want to be at zero, zero for for anything besides ammonia and nitrite, right? Uh, we want to have some nitrate and phosphate in the tank always available so we don't run into denoflagellate issues or anything like that. Um, and then at that point, you do tend to get like random coral deaths, you know? It'll happen to a coral here, a coral there, coral somewhere in the back it might not be getting enough flow anymore uh, it might be getting you know a bunch of detritus on it. it it might not be getting enough light anymore um all sorts of things can happen you know and then uh for sps you know rtn stn um they're coming to see more and more clear now that it's it's kind of bacteria factors uh, Vibrio and so on so forth other bacterial like infections and viral infections and things like that that can cause the SPS to RTN or STN well that's a whole nother thing you know it, it 
if it starts with one SPS and it bleaches out on you and it just RTNs out overnight and then you wake up, you come look at the tank and you see a white skeleton there, you're like, holy crap, what happened? You know? And then next thing you know, you're kind of sitting there and you're crossing your fingers. You're like, hey, I hope it's just that one coral and it's not some kind of crazy bacteria going around that is going to target all of my coral. And sometimes it could be one or the other. It can be just one random death or it can be something like a bacterial infection that I think um, Mike Paletta was dealing with in his tank. Uh, where he was just getting the one colony, just RTN out, and then next thing you know, another colony, and then another colony, and so on and so forth. So, it, it's, it's constant battles with these tanks. Um, so, let's say you, you get through all of that, and now you're at like the three year, three plus year mark. At this point... You know, if you've been keeping up on things and you've been just kind of coasting, letting things do what they're supposed to do, trying to combat all of these daily, weekly, monthly battles, um, by that time you're going to have a pretty filled in tank with, with a good amount of coral. So that initial battle that I was saying about, you know, coral warfare growing into each other, you know, and killing each other and stuff like that, that's going to be even more so because those mini colonies have now turned into actual big old colonies and you need to now keep cutting them back so they don't choke each other out or grow onto each other and things like that and at this point i think it's it's kind of important too that once your corals are that big Nutrients is something that you need to monitor on a weekly basis because if, if your corals are that big, you may hit a threshold where they just start taking up a bunch of nutrients and you've been feeding the same for the last year. So yeah, and at, at this point with the corals being so big, you know, maintaining those nutrients and keeping them in balance is it's a little bit of a job you know you you definitely I'm not saying you're gonna have to tweak things all the time or anything like that it's just you still want to do your weekly testing just to watch those trends to make sure that it's going right and it's smooth and you're not getting sharp drops in nutrients or sharp ups in nutrients if you have a sand bed you know, like in this corner of my tank and then that corner of my tank, um, my power heads have moved a lot of the sand to the side, so they, they're pretty high. They're like four inches in some spots, four and a half, five inches. Um, so potentially those are nutrient traps, right? So if something disturbs that, like the fish or anything like that, you could release a bunch of nutrients into your tank and then you can have a spike and all sorts of stuff can happen. So that's kind of why we do our, our weekly testing on our um, on our tanks. So yeah, I just wanted to make this video just to kind of talk about the ongoing battles that we can have with these tanks. It never really stops. Um, you know, we get to certain points where you're like, "Wow, this is this is a beautiful tank." and you just sit there and you can just watch it and it just hits all the right notes for you, you know? And then all of a sudden you get this Aptasia that pops up and you're like, ah, oh, here we go. And then it starts taking over and that's the point I'm at right now. You know, I talked about it in my last video. Um, and it can be disheartening, you know? You just, you're like, man, I've gone through so much crap and for something like Aptasia to make me want to just shut the tank down, you have to stop yourself from thinking that way, right? You have to make yourself understand that, hey, you, you've been through so much already 
and you need to actually try the different methods and give it time for those methods to work as well. So yeah guys, um, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for hearing me out. And as always, you guys have a wonderful day and keep on reefing.